This is going to be interesting because my tablet isn't working. <laughs> so uh, somebody pray, and then uh, but otherwise I'll be making it up as I go along. You really don't want that, and neither do I. We're two weeks into our 21 days of prayer and fasting, nearly two-thirds of the way through. Anyone hungry? If you listen carefully, you could hear the stomachs rumbling over the, over the sound of electric guitar. <laughs> Lots of people hungry. What are you hungry for? You're missing the major food groups? Crisps, beer, curry, something else? Bethany has been helping me with perseverance and endurance. She's been baking and eating prawn cocktail flavoured Pringles around me. So, uh, yeah, she's been blessing me. Like that. If you're hungry, what, are, you, are you just hungry for food? Or are you hungry for anything else? Are you hungry for someone else? Are you thirsty for living water, streams of living water? to flow through you. That's what God deals in. God doesn't deal in bottles. He deals in streams of living water. Amen? Isn't that right? And when the Bible tells us to be filled with the Holy Spirit, it's not talking about a one-off or a two-off or a three-off. In Ephesians, it's talking about go on being filled. It's a continuous thing of being filled with the Holy Spirit. God has got more in store for you, church. He has. And don't be shy. Don't hold back. I think we need to be a little bit Oliver Twist about this. Please, Lord, I want some more. You know? And he's not a Mr. Bumble who's going, more? It's not like that. Our God is not like that. I think he's a, do you know, I think he's like a, he's like a chef who's prepared this lavish feast and all he wants us to do is to tuck in and enjoy and he's thrilled the more we have the more he's thrilled the more it thrills his heart amen and somebody understood this and cast out there's been a coup from his own son and you'll need the bible text on screen because i haven't got the bible text on this screen There's been a coup, his son Absalom. 1 Samuel, I think it's 15, tells us about it. Absalom, he'd been exiled, he'd come back, and he started being the big man, and he won the hearts of Israel. So much so, he starts to declare himself king, and David gets a message, and off he goes, and he goes towards what's now Jordan, and he goes through the desert of Judah, wilderness. It's dry, it's arid. In the wet season, there's flowers and there's, you know, there's some vegetation, but it's not a place you'd want to stay too long, like Sunderland. I'm kidding, I am kidding. And that's where he's been cast out to. He's had to leave everything behind. This really isn't working. Okay. There's no point standing there, is there? (laughs) But David has been... Although he's in a wilderness, literally, and he's in a wilderness socially, David is not in a wilderness, spiritually. Because he knows who his God is. He has experienced time and presence with his God. Hey? You're going to have to touch. It might work now. Okay, praise the Lord. Amen. You want to try, to try and get it working, Ashley? And then we'll, I'll just carry on. He's in a literal wilderness. He's in a sp- 
social wilderness, he's not in a spiritual wilderness. And this comes through in this psalm. Let's read just those first few verses again. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My God. That's what he says. My God. Not just God. My God. He's got a personal relationship with him. It is not enough, church, to speak to God as some far off living in the clouds, guy with a beard, that is not who he is. He wants a relationship with you. The Bible has something to say about people who believe in God. In James, it says, even the demons believe in God. And what good does it do them? None. It's not enough to believe in God. You have to believe God. And he is ours by creation, by maker. Is it working? Praise the Lord for Ashley. Woman of extreme talents. Awesome. Thank you very much. Hey, I don't need it. (laughs) He's ours by creation. We are all made in the image of God. And if we're Christ's, We are his by new creation too. And I want to ask you, is that your experience of God today? You're all his by creation. Are you his by new creation? And if you're not, you're in the right place. If you're not, we're going to try and do something about that today in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 Oh, Ashley, bless your heart. Don't know where I am now. There we go. If you're watching online, talk amongst yourselves. So Dave, Dave is in this trauma. He's on his own. But because he knows who his God is, he's already prophesying about what's going to happen. That's what he's talking about when he talks about the, the mouths of liars are going to be silenced. It's not a prayer that something might happen. It's a statement that this will happen. He knows his God. He knew he was being punished. David, you remember? He's got everything. He's got the whole kingdom. God has established him and he's up on the roof when he should have been out at war. And he sees an attractive looking woman who's taken a bath on the roof. And he thinks, quite fancy that. And off he goes, gets her up and uh, sleeps with her and then sends her husband off to the front line to get, to get killed. And Nathan the prophet comes to him and speaks a curse over him. Out of your own household, I'm going to bring calamity upon you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you. He will lie with your wives in broad daylight. So David knows that God is involved in what is happening to him. But his trust is still in God because he knows who he is. Do you know him? Do you know him personally? You need to not just believe in God, you need to believe God. Right, let's try and get this going again. Here we go, here we go. You are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. And that word earnestly, it means at dawn. I was talking with uh, Aaron Benjamin a few weeks back. He was telling me he had some exams to do. So what do you do? He was up at three in the morning doing his revision. I'm sure that's earnestness, not leaving it to the last minute. Is that right? He was eager. He's talking about eagerness. David's eager. Takes God seriously, takes his relationship with God seriously. Despite all his flaws, he knows the God whom he serves. He was a man after God's own heart. He's not apathetic. David is described as someone who is wholehearted. Church, we need to be wholehearted when it comes to our relationship with God, not half hearted, not one foot in, one foot out. We've got to be all in. All in. 
Get going now. Come on. This is good. David was praying at dawn. Jesus would get up while it was still dark and go and pray. And I find that's a really easy thing to do at this time of year. <laughs> not, so much, not so much in the summer. A bit harder in the summer. This time of year, yeah, get up praying before dawn. No bother. There's nothing particularly special about early morning prayers. Nothing particularly holy about early morning prayers. Right? But here's what I want you to realise. Our time is like our money, so it belongs to God, right? Colossians 3.23 says, um, uh, in everything you do, work at it with all your heart as though working for the Lord, not for men, since you'll know you'll receive an inheritance from Christ Jesus uh, as a reward. Everything. And if the tithe of our money uh, is the first fruit, I wonder if the tithe of our time is a first fruit as well. So some of you will say, well, I'm not a morning person. And looking around, I can, I can see that. I'm not a morning person, but that's, that's not really the point. That's fine. But just ask, is God getting your best? Is God getting your first? Or is God getting the dregs after work and family and uh, TV and social media and hobbies? Is he getting your best? Or is he getting the, I've done all of that and I'm half asleep near the end of the day, and I'll try and fit him in before my eyes close. The great evangelist, uh, John Wesley, he went out preaching at five in the morning. Five in the morning, because people were going off to work. So when was he going to get them? When were they going to hear him? They were going to hear him before they went to work. And he said he never lacked a congregation. People were so keen, so eager to hear the word. They were going to get out they were going to hear the word, and then they were going to go off to work. Some of us struggled to get here for 10.30. Around the, about the same time, there was, um, the church was going through some weird stuff at the time. And uh, there was a kid, in, uh, about a 10-year-old, he was in Lincolnshire. He would walk 10 miles every Sunday to go and hear the word. 10 miles. So I sort of did, I got Google Maps out. That's um, Crook. That's the south side of Darlington. That's Trimden. To come here. That's what he's walking. In Wales, there's a young lady called um, Mary Jones. Where she lived, it was two miles to the nearest uh, house with a Bible. So at nine years old, she started saving up for her own Bible. When she was 15, so she saved for six years. When she was 15, she walked 26 miles barefoot over the mountain to a place called Bala to buy a Bible. That is eagerness. That is desire. That is hunger. That is thirst for God and his word. That's walking from here to the metro centre over a mountain to get a Bible. Who's up for that? She was so eager, so eager. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Is that our longing? Is that where we're at? He's in dry land. Water's difficult to come by. That's the analogy that he uses. His craving for water is like his craving for God. We need water to survive. It's essential. Stop drinking water, your major, major organs start to fail, including your brain, you die a horrible death. Do we see our need for the word and time with God as anything approaching our need for water to keep, our, keep ourselves going, keep our bodies alive? Do we crave him as much as our bodies crave water? Psalm 42 Verses 1 and 2 says, As the deer pants for the water, so my soul pants after you. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. Job 23, 12. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. I felt this was really pertinent in a time of prayer and fasting, you know. When Jesus came into the 
uh, came to earth, people had been waiting 400 years. 400 years. You would have thought that they would be incredibly thirsty for a revelation of God, but they weren't. But there was, there was a guy. It's called Simeon. You can read about him in Luke 2.25. He's an old man, but it tells us he was still looking forward to the consolation of Israel. He was eager. He was thirsty. Why did the crowds follow Jesus wherever he went? Because they were eager. They were thirsty. They were hungry for him. Mark chapter 2, 1 and 2 tells us Jesus was in Capernaum and word gets around. Jesus is in the house. So what happened? A crowd gathered. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. They were hungry, church. They were thirsty, church, for the presence of God. David says, I've seen you in the sanctuary. I've beheld your power and your glory. David has seen God. David has experienced God. He's experienced his power. He's experienced his love. He's experienced his glory. And now he's in the wilderness. And he takes the experiences that he had in the sanctuary and he takes them into the wilderness. They give life to his present relationship. He's in a dead, arid place, but they give him life because of what God has done before. If you remember God's acts, you'll trust in God's promises. Let me say that again. If you remember God's acts, You will trust in God's promises. David has seen God. He's thinking back to being in God's presence. He's in a literal desert, talking about a literal tent and a literal ark. Now, that's not true for us, but it wasn't true for the early church either. And they used to take this psalm and they would use it in their prayer time because they were in a wilderness too and they realized that they had the sanctuary of prayer, going into God's presence through prayer. And that's why they used this psalm. The tent had gone. The temple had gone. The ark had gone. But they understood the need to be in God's presence in prayer. He was in the wilderness, but he didn't let what he saw make him forget what God had said. Never let what you see make you forget what God has said. If you're feeling in the wilderness, remember that God has gone before you. If you're feeling in the wilderness, remember what God has done before that time. Find him in the sanctuary of prayer. The Lord has done great things for us. And we are, no we're not, come on. The Lord has done great things for us and we are, we're glad, we're glad. His soul was thirsty. His body longed for him in this dry and weary place. But he remembers what God is doing, what God's been doing, what God's going to do. And when, he's, when it talks about remembering here, it's not just, oh yeah, 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 I kind of, I have a recall of that. He's talking about meditating, filling his mind with what God has done. Not just thinking about it and then moving on. And when, God's to- when David talks about seeking after God, it's not that because he's lost him. It's not because he's forgotten about him. He doesn't need to go looking for him. He's just expressing this heart of longing, this hunger for God. And he has absolute confidence that God is going to supply all his needs. Because he's seen him before. He's been with him before. He knows what he's like. He's a God of power, of glory, a God of love. I want to tell you this morning, God loves you. God loves you. God loves you with an everlasting love. It's an everlasting love. It's an enduring love. It's an exciting love. It's an uncompromising love. It's an unending love. It's an all-encompassing love. That is the love that God has for you. And his love is better than life, David says. Better than life. You know, Jesus' disciples came to him. Um, one day he'd been teaching them, and then he said some hard stuff, and lots of people started, just left. And uh, Jesus says to them, 
What about you? Are you going to go as well? Do you know what the disciples said? Where are we going to go? Where are we going to go, Jesus? You have the words of eternal life. You are the one in whom we're going to find all the answers. You are the one in whom we're going to find the love that we need. His love was better than life. Is better than life. Where are you going to go? Well, there's nowhere to go. When you found Jesus, there's nowhere else to go. There's nowhere better. Your love is better than life. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. Church, what's going on inwardly eventually is going to come out. If we're spending time in God's presence. Eventually, that's going to come forth. In praise, it's got to, has to believe that. I don't believe that there's any other option. Has to come out. Remembering leads to praise. Praise leads to fullness. Fullness leads to praise. Again, it's like this virtuous circle that's going on. He meets us as we praise. And as he meets us, we praise. And when he meets us, he satisfies that deep craving that we have that can't be satisfied anywhere else, that craving we have to be with our maker, our saviour, our redeemer, our Lord Jesus. And what he gives us isn't a few, it's not this, thank you for this. This is not what God gives us. He doesn't give us a few sips out of a water bottle and some travel rations. That is not the feast. He gives us a feast. He's not going to give you the dregs, the leftovers, the second bests. He's going to give you the richest of spiritual food, things you've never dreamed of him doing. Things you've never tasted before, never imagined before. That's coming. That is coming for you. Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? What are you hungry and thirsty for? Who are you hungry and thirsty for? It's got to be more than the food and drink that you're fasting right now. Otherwise, you're just going to be hungry and you're not going to be satisfied. Jesus didn't say, blessed are those who hunger and thirst. All right, actually, he did say that. But there was a, there was a rider. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. The righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, Romans says. And Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him, just As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. Amen. Amen. Jesus told his disciples to feed on him. He wasn't talking literally, obviously. But it is him and only him who will satisfy that deep need we have. The need to have our relationship with our maker restored. The need for forgiveness from sin day by day. The need to live a life that leads to eternity and not to hopelessness. That's why he died on the cross. Precisely so we could have all that. So we could be who we were created to be, which is children of God. And satisfaction comes from accepting Jesus as Lord and Saviour. And then following him. That's the whole point of our existence. The whole point of our existence is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Christians have known that for centuries. That's how we find satisfaction for our spirit. That's where our meaning and purpose is in Jesus. Why spend, Isaiah says, why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat 
what is good and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. There it is again, the feast. Give ear and come to me that your soul may live. Our prayer needs to be, Lord, more. Give me more. Give us more, more of you. Not because it makes us feel good, it does. Not because it makes us feel empowered or it empowers us, it does. But because we want to be more like Jesus. Does anyone here want to be more like Jesus? I want to be more like Jesus. I want to be more like him. That's the cry in my heart. And we can never have too much of what God has to offer. His stores are not going to run out. His streams are not going to run dry. Our God is a bountiful God. And he's a generous God. And he's longing to give us more. There's lots of things we could crave. Lots of things. We're going to be hungry for something in this life. Let's make sure it's God. Let's make sure it's Jesus. This psalm is a glorious testimony of a life so sold out for God, so filled with praise to God that everything around David constantly reminded him of God's love and his protection and his help. His greatest delight, his greatest pleasure was to be in God's presence. And because that's where he spent so much time, is it any wonder that he was so full of praise? Is it any wonder that David, who spent so much time with God, has got umpteen psalms that he wrote? I don't think so. I think there's a connection there. Even in the middle of a coup, even when he's on the run, even when he's in the wilderness, he's writing this psalm. He's writing his praise, talking about his hope in God. I pray that God gives us that spirit, spirit of praise. And wherever the day takes you, or whether life, wherever life takes you, you'll be reminded of our great and wondrous God. David had been sold out by those close to him. But he was still sold out for God. He'd been cast out. But he hadn't dropped out from walking with God. David was still a man after his own heart. I want that kind of relationship. I want that kind of sold out, all guns blazing, nothing's getting in my way kind of relationship with God. There's a world out there with people yearning, just as we close. There's a world out there, people yearning for all sorts of things. Money and security and fame and new car and next house or, or maybe, just a, maybe just a nice holiday. They're not bad things. They're good things. Great. Praise God for them. But if that's where it stops, we'll never be satisfied. Church, we are children of the Most High God, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. I think our ambitions need to be a bit higher than that. God has got more. They're not bad things. Don't hear what I'm not saying. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying they're bad things. They're good things. They're gifts from God. But don't let it stop there. God has got more. We need to have bigger ambitions than that. You know, there's people here today who are in the wilderness, in the desert. And you might be hiding it. We're very good at that. We are very, very good at that. You're feeling, turn up, you're feeling rubbish. Get to the door, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm great. Praise the Lord. Actually, we had a word in the prayer meeting yesterday about that, from Esther, about taking off masks. Okay, not everyone wants to share everything to everyone. That's, you know, that's totally fine. But are you talking to God? Are you bringing it to God? You're in the world. David was in the wilderness. He used it as an opportunity to praise. It's not wrong to be in the wilderness. The wilderness can be a blessed time. The best of Christians have found themselves in the wilderness. Jesus was in the wilderness. It's not wrong to be in the wilderness. But what do you do with your time there? That's the thing. That's the thing. 
You're going to talk to him like David talked to him. You're going to get real with him. Tell him, speak to him, use these words. Because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. Now, I believe our desperation for God positions us for breakthrough and whatever is going on in our lives. When we're desperate for him, our will, our mind, our actions, they come into alignment with him. And when we learn to persist through the tough times, we learn to praise in the tough times. Let's be real, there's going to be temptations, there's going to be trials that try and draw us away from God. The Bible says that in these last days, the love of many will grow cold. So during this time of prayer and fasting, put down a marker, church. Put down a marker. Don't get to the end of it and flip back to how things were. Put down a marker today or next Sunday at the end of it. God, my desperation is going to be for you. My longing is going to be for you. My craving is going to be for you. Put down a marker that decides your hunger and thirst is going to be for God. Begin with the small things. Your private prayer time, your private Bible time. Being with God's people. Join a connect group. I love our connect group. Other connect groups are available. Stay hungry for God. Be longing for him to move in a new way. Stay hungry to see him revive. Stay hungry to see him restore. Stay hungry to see him bless. Stay hungry to see him heal. Stay hungry to see him provide. Stay hungry for God's, God's presence in your life. And he will satisfy again and again and again and again. His satisfaction is guaranteed. It's guaranteed. Well, before we finish, I've got to ask, if there's anyone here and you're feeling empty from trying to satisfy the cravings in your soul, in your life with something other than Jesus, come to him. Come to him with all your heart. Discover the fullness that God has for you. You ready for more? It's not enough to know about God. You need to know him. It's not enough to believe in God. You need to believe him and his promises, the promises of his word. You're already his by creation. He wants you to be his by new creation. He's ready to transform you. Are you willing to be changed? Let's just pray and, and just pray with me. And if you're praying for this, follow me in prayer. If you've never given your life to Christ, just pray with me. And the rest of the church will be praying along and, and help you and encourage you in that. And then let us know. Just these few words. There's nothing magic about them. Just going to talk to God about our need. Lord God, I need you. I recognize that I've been trying to fill my life with all sorts of things. Now today, I realize I need to fill my life with you. Lord God, forgive me. I've walked away from you many times. But now I'm coming back. I'm running towards you. God, please accept me. Thank you that you do accept me. I realize now what I've been missing. God, do a work in my life today. 
Thank you for your salvation. Thank you for Jesus dying on the cross for me. Thank you that he's raised and reigning in heaven. I accept the salvation that you give me. I'm going to follow you now and every day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And if that's you and you're in the church today, let us know. If you're online, drop us a line. Details should be on the screen. That would be fabulous to hear. Well, communion is, as we turn to communion, you know, we normally it's really reflective. And the pianist plays very reflective chords. And it's all quite mellow. Not doing that today. Stand up. Stand up, everyone, if you're able to. That's it, David. Bring it up a notch. This is a time to praise, isn't it? When we look at what this is, what it stands for, it's a time to praise. You, we worship a God who satisfies. Satisfaction is guaranteed, church. Amen. He's worthy of praise. Just close your eyes now and just take delight from being in his presence. He wants time with you. That's what he wants. You know, the Jews had to come and bring animal sacrifices. We haven't got that rigmarole. Jesus' sacrifice has done it all. The work of the cross is a finished work. Jesus has a victory over sin and death and hell. He is and was and always will be all the sacrifice that is necessary. We are covered by the blood of Jesus. Let's pray. Lord God, how we praise you today. We don't want to be muted and subdued. We worship a living God. We worship the one who was raised from the dead and reigns on high, who has transformed our lives, brought us from death to life. We're going to be excited this morning, Lord, as we take communion. Our souls are thrilled, God, as we consider and contemplate the bread and the juice and all it means. We're excited to be called children of God. And God, we cry out more. Give us more, Lord. Will you give us more? Give us more of your Holy Spirit for our healing and for our restoration. Bring revival, we pray. The wonder of communion is not something to keep quiet. It's something to shout from the rooftops. Praise you, Jesus, for what you've done. We love you, Lord. Take your bread. And say hallelujah with me for what this means. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, just as the band come back up and the singers get ready to lead us, well, let me just leave you that last verse that I've repeated a few times. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods, with singing lips. My mouth will praise you. Well, let's do that. Do you want to praise Jesus? Is he worthy of our praise? Is he worthy of some enthusiasm and some glory in the house? Let's get ready to it. If we can enter his gates with thanksgiving and praise, we can certainly exit his gates with thanksgiving and praise. Amen. Let's pray. Let's sing. Sorry, let's sing. Amen. <laughs>